So um, I'm going to start with a little story. This happened uh, years ago. I was a teacher. I was teaching actually at TJ uh, biology and physical science. And uh, I hate to admit this, but I hated going to fifth period class. And the reason I hated going to fifth period class is because Jonathan was going to be there. And I knew when Jonathan was there, I was not going to get any teaching done. What would happen is there'd be a disruption or, you know, something happening every single time. And uh, I'd have him come to my classroom every day after school when he was actually in school. And we'd have this conversation. How was your day? Oh, I got a referral. Why'd you get a referral? I did such and such. Well, why'd you do such and such? You know, if you do such and such, you get a referral. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. We had that same conversation over and over again until one day the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and told me to ask a different question. And that day I said, what happened to you that hurt you so bad? Now, we had been told that this ninth grade young man was in foster care, but nobody ever told us why. And that day I found out when he said that a year and a half before, he came home to find his mother shot dead on the living room floor by her boyfriend. You know, that day I, I cried with that young man and I said, I'm so sorry. Nobody should ever have to go through anything like that. And, um, and that day that young man became a model student in my classroom. Now, how do you explain that? We can't really with words. But that day, the Holy Spirit spoke to that young man's heart through me hearing something, asking a question. And I will tell you the last time that I saw that young man, he started coming over to the church at the time I was a youth pastor. And the last time I saw him, we were behind the church playing make it, take it basketball. And this other boy was crushing us. Um, and, and Jonathan said, that's okay, man. I got the Holy Ghost on my side. And so um, I had always wondered what happened to him, and I didn't learn until just a few months ago what happened to him. Um, that young man, when he turned 22 years old, he was in Virginia, and he was driving late at night and fell asleep and had a car accident and passed away. You know, that's sad, but I heard from someone who knew him that his funeral was full of people acknowledging him, acknowledging his contribution to their lives. And so for me, it's tragic that he was taken so young, but it's, it's wonderful at the same time because he got to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only did he get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, he got to know the freedom and the deliverance of the Holy Spirit speaking directly to his heart to heal something traumatic. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter? In the mid-1990s, Kaiser Permanente did a study with the Centers for Disease Control. And in that study, they found an exposure that increases the risk of death in seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. Those things are um, heart disease, liver disease, lung disease, diabetes, obesity, um, an, a propensity toward addiction. Those are some of them. And, and what is that one thing that creates that kind of effect that increases the risk of death? You already know, because you know the topic of today's talk. Um, but if you didn't know, we might imagine that it was some kind of a food or, or some kind of a chemical, something like that. But what it really is, is adverse childhood experiences. So, in this study, Kaiser Permanente and the CDC asked 10 questions of a group of people who were insured. And because they were insured, they had a background of, of their health outcomes. So they asked them these 10 things. And, and I'm not going to say the exact questions, but these are the general topics. Um, have you ever experienced um, emotional neglect or abuse? physical neglect or abuse, sexual abuse, and all of these things are prior to the age of 18. So I'll repeat those, emotional neglect or abuse, 
physical neglect or abuse, sexual abuse, violence in the household, separation or divorce of parents, incarceration in the family, mental health issues in the family, or addictions in the family. Those were the questions that they asked in the mid-1990s. And what they found was in the entirety of the population that was surveyed, 67% um, of the population had at least one adverse childhood experience. One in, one in eight had four or more. And, um, and what happens whenever there are at least four? Some people will say at least three. There's an actual change in the structure and the function of the brain. What happens is the amygdala, which is the center of the fight, flight, freeze response, it's hyperactivated. So that whenever there's a conflict or a perceived conflict, there's a heightened response to it. What does that look like? It looks like uh, an increased fight. So you might notice that um, well, we'll, when we're looking at what's going on right now with, with, our, with our nation, these, these riots and these kinds of things, there was some kind of a conflict and, and that conflict is not resolved. And so that conflict or perceived conflict has a, an over the top response. You might notice it if you're walking down the street and accidentally bump into someone and there's a, a kind of a, a, an aggressive response to that rather than an excuse me. So one thing that happens is an increased fight. The next thing is an increased flight response so that when there's a conflict or perceived conflict, people just run away. They avoid it altogether. Don't show up. Have you ever had that happen? You're in a conversation with somebody, there's a disagreement and they just like disappear. Or maybe, maybe you're the one that disappears, you know? Um, and the other thing is a freeze response. We just don't do anything at all. We just get absolutely stuck where we are with no change of any kind and we stay there in that stuckness. So this increased fight, flight, freeze response I'll say is normal for what we've been through. Why does that matter? The young man that I was talking about, Jonathan, for what he had been through, his response was absolutely normal. Now, I didn't think it was as a teacher. Actually, it aggravated me and I didn't even want to go to class. I like, I, I didn't want, I was happy on the days he was suspended. And I hate to admit that, but prior to me asking a different question, that's, that was my feeling. So there's a change in the amygdala, the fight, flight, freeze response. There's also um, an enlargement of the hippocampus. So that place is the place of, of inhibitions. So that there's a, a decrease in, in inhibitions. And that will actually continue on. So a change in the structure and fu function of the brain, and then also an increased, um, an increased response to health problems. Why is that? Um, what happens is that whenever we have any kind of a thought, any kind of a response, there is an instant physiology in the body or an instant response in the body. You know, um, we know the body as the temple of the Holy Ghost. And often whenever we're listening to spirit, we might have a feeling. Some people will say, well, I've got a feeling in my shoulder. I need to go that way. Or, or maybe it's just a, an urging in your heart, whatever that is. But this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And in the temple of the Holy Ghost, whenever there, we have a thought, there's a response to it. You know this. You, you've experienced it often. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you have an embarrassing thought, what happens? Think about it a minute. An embarrassing thought, sometimes our face will flush, maybe we'll get a warmth, a warm sensation. Or what if you have an angry thought? What happens? You feel a little tension, a little, little heightened response. On the flip side, what if, what if you have a joyful thought? What does that feel like? Every single time that we have a thought there is a response in the temple of the Holy Ghost 
to that thought. That's why the Bible says in, in Corinthians to take captive every thought and submit it to the obedience of Jesus Christ. There's a reason for it. Like it doesn't just say that just because. Every time that we have a thought, there is a response in our body to the thought. And then depending on what the thought is, we will act according to the thought. So let's, let's play this out for a minute. So I have a thought and then there is a feeling or a physiology to the thought. So let's say it's an angry thought. The physiology to it may be tension or an urge to yell or something like that. What's the response then? The action that follows can be yelling, it can be fighting, it can be rioting, whatever that is, the end result never lies. Whatever we've thought in the first place, we can tell what it was by looking at our, our results, the results in our lives. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, whenever, whenever the Lord says, take captive every thought and submit it to the obedience of Jesus Christ, every moment of every day, we get to make a choice. What is that choice? So I have an angry thought. I get to decide in the next moment, what am I doing with that? Am I going to say, I'm mad and you made me mad to the person that I'm disagreeing with? I can choose that. Or am I going to say, I am responsible for how I feel. I'm going to direct to this energy in a way that's beneficial and have a conversation rather than a fight. So when a person's been through adverse childhood experiences, there's a change, that change in the structure and function of the brain um, means that they may not have something called executive function. Executive function might be that ability to self-soothe or to dis make decisions or to choose. There's an instant response. Um, and so think about that Think about that in your own life, just for a moment. Is there something that, um, that has been a, a challenging conflict or a perceived conflict? Is there a person that has been a challenge to you or is there a situation that has been a challenge to you? What do you do with it? Um, whenever the Lord says, take captive every thought and submit it to the obedience of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of other scriptures that we can use in alignment with that. For example, think on those things that are good. Whenever, whenever that situation is difficult or, or you're in the midst of a, a challenging situation, do you, do you ever stop and say, let me think on the good. I haven't done that often, and it, it takes a lot of practice, but we get, we get to choose in every single moment. So what does that look like? It looks like catching someone doing something good, even when there's a challenge in it. Can you imagine that? Um, Lucinda, I want to I, I wanna ask, I would like some feedback here. Is that possible? Can you unmute for just a moment? Okay. I'm here. So, well, I mean, unmute everybody. Everyone, okay. Yeah, just, for, just for a moment. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, unmuted. So, so, is there anyone that would like to, like, give an example of something that I'm talking about, a place where there's been a challenge or um, a conflict or a perceived conflict? Have, have you ever gone through this process before of choosing, choosing something else? And I think Shelley, are you talking about Philippians four eight? Whatever is good, whatever. I am. I am, I am yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry for not bringing that up. Yes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. And then a little bit further down in verse eight, think on these things. So if you're, if some people are not, if some people are still muted, you have to unmute yourself because I've tried to unmute you. 
So something must be going on in your, oh, there we go. So people it's, are doing it. It's, it's okay. Well, so Shelly, I've got one. Um, sure. Why well, not? Our son Scott struggled for 14 years with addiction. Mm -hmm. And I thank God I found Celebrate Recovery, who helped, which helped me deal with my own issues. Uh -huh. But the reason I went to Celebrate Recovery was because my thoughts were in a big circle of fear. Fear, fear, fear. And somewhere in those lessons at Celebrate Recovery, I learned that Philippians 4 verse. And so when I'd be driving to work and I'd have that horrible, fearful thought, um, I'd say, nope. I, and I'd, start, I'd say out loud, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, and I couldn't always get all that string of words, but as I said that, all I could think of that matched up with those words was Jesus. And my thought pattern went from this circle of fear and worry and horror to Jesus. And you know what? I'm like, that worked. And so I started doing that on a regular basis, and it's just automatic now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have an example? So I'm going to tell you a story about my friend Mary and her son Matt. So when when Matt was five years old, um, he had a he man. And I'll just say Matt got really upset, and he went run into my to my friend Mary and said, "Mom, mom, it's not right." I'm so mad. Jennifer made me so mad. She dressed my He-Man up like a girl. <laughs> and and Mary, um, being the the mom who was nurturing her children in the in the Lord, said to Matt, Matt, nobody can make you mad. You get to choose. So Jennifer can't make you mad by doing that. And so when he, when he understood that as a little five-year-old boy, he went running back to his sister with his he-man in girl clothes and said, nah, nah, you can't make me mad. You can't make me mad. <laughs> and so there, there is a real power to this. Now, let, let's get back to the adverse childhood experiences. We talked about 10 things, physical and emotional neglect and abuse, sexual abuse, violence in the household, separation and divorce of parents, incarceration in the family, mental health issues in the family, and addiction in the family. So when we have a certain number of those, again, there's a change in the structure and function of the brain, but where does healing come? We know that in, in Romans, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the washing of the water of the word. Um, when we study psychology, up to the age of six, there is no conscience. The conscience doesn't exist. So what does that mean? That means up to the age of six, and sometimes a little bit later than that, everything that's happening in the world around us becomes a part of who we are. And we actually make lifetime decisions often before the age of six. So what does that mean? We don't have the ability to accept or reject. So if the adults in our lives are communicating via loud screaming, we learn to communicate via loud screaming. You know, we follow the example of those in our lives. If there are um, drugs in the household, a child will learn that that's the norm. Um, or whatever, whatever is happening in, in the household, Genesis talks about that, that the iniquities of the parents are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. But what does scripture say in contrast to that? The blessings of the parents are visited to the thousandth generation. So what does that say? Even when we've been through difficult times or the people that we're praying for have been through difficult times, there is hope. And so what do we do to break that cycle? I'll use a story in my own life as an example. I had two experiences when I was four years old. Um, the first one, my brother and I, we had a red wagon and uh, we made an agreement that 
I would pull him in the wagon all the way to the end of the block. And when we got to the end of the block, we changed places and then he would pull me back. Well, guess what happened? I was four, he was three. We got to the end of the block. And what do you think the three-year-old said? No, pull me back. And so um, as a four-year-old child, I, I said, that's not fair. And I didn't know what to do with that. And my reaction to that was to take the handle of the wagon and throw it. What I didn't know and didn't have the ability to see ahead of time was that that wagon handle was going to come right like this and hit my brother in the forehead, cut his head, and that he would be bleeding. So I immediately started running back home, shouting, I didn't do anything, I didn't do anything. And my mother met us in the front yard. Of course, my brother was bleeding and she went to him and she looked at me and she said, what did you do? And, and she didn't talk to me. She just paid attention to my brother. And how I interpreted that was I was bad. I had to go in the house because I had done that thing. Another experience happened when my grandmother came to visit. My mother was away. My grandmother was watching my brother and I, or my brother and me, and um, we had a honeysuckle vine on the side of the porch. And that honeysuckle vine, I love to pull the flowers off and break the back of it and then suck the nectar out of the back. And my grandmother said, don't do that. And again, being four years old, I said, mommy lets me do that. She said, mind me. I said, stop. But I continued to do it. And then the third time she said, you're being bad. I'm going to get the spatula if you don't stop. Well, I didn't know what a spatula was. So I just kept on. And then I learned very quickly what a spatula was when she grabbed me by the arm and swatted me on the rear end with that spatula and sent me inside because I was bad. So those were two confirmations to, to me as a four-year-old child that I was bad. Why does that matter? I will tell you that in school, I got almost straight A's. I was at the top of the class throughout school, um, graduated from Hood with honors, did uh, the, the first pictures of the AIDS virus at Fort Detrick um, in a lab there when we didn't even know what AIDS was, um, have excelled, became a number one woman karate fighter, excelled through my life in everything that I did. And that voice was always in the back of my head saying, but you're bad. Traveling and doing missions around the world and praying for people and the prayers being answered for healing or whatever else they were asking for, and that voice was saying, but you're bad. The, the enemy of our souls will use any occasion to not only accuse us to one another, but to accuse us to ourselves. And so when we're, when we're experiencing conflict or stuckness or, or whatever it is, some kind of something that's not, uh, where a person's not fulfilling um, their potential in life, there's often something that happened. It goes back even to their youngest childhood and a decision that was made or something that was said that sticks. So again, why is that important? Every single one of us have had some kind of experience like that. There is, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will, with that temptation, make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Um, whether it is a habitual conflict or yelling whenever we get angry, or if it's listening to that voice in the back of our head, or if it's having a conversation with someone else but not ever really hearing them because we're just waiting to talk. Whatever that looks like. And so... So these adverse childhood experiences um, we carry with us, but we're not alone. Every single person on the planet has had something that they perceive 
as um, negative. Maybe it really was negative, like Jonathan that I talked about. Um, you know, that, that's a very, very tragic thing to experience. But some other people might have a similar response just to their grandmother spanking them on the rear end with a spatula. I will tell you that um, that voice in my head thinking that I was bad, um, I had an, a real anger issue. And the, the karate that I, I started that actually when I was 11 years old and, um, and just doing something with my physical body helped me to control my anger. Um, is it interesting though, when we get a hold of something, if the Lord's not in the midst of it and we don't know the scripture to go along with it and we haven't replaced the tape in our head, like Lucinda said, Lucinda was talking about that cycle of fear until she got Jesus in the midst of the scripture. Until we get that, that thing, whatever it is, can continue to rise up. So, so for me, um, in my teen years, 15, 16, I was a very angry and got hold of it. Um, in my 20s, I used to say over and over again, um, the Psalm 103, it's not in my brain right now, 103, um, Lord, God, put a watch on my lips, guard the door of my mouth over and over and over again. I'd said that over and over and over and over and over again, all the time. And the Lord helped me with that until one day my guard was down. I was in my middle thirties. I was driving up the road and somebody cut me off and out of the blue, I hollered in obscenity and I shocked myself. I thought, what in the, where did that come from? Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, seeks like a roaring lion whom he may devour. He is always on the prowl. And so it's important when we're in the midst of this in, in life and in, in praying for others in our own lives that we know to stay vigilant, stay prayed up, Stay listening to the Holy Spirit day by day and moment by moment. Not only, not only for ourselves, but for those we interact with. Again, adverse childhood experiences. Up to the age of six, there is not a conscience. So whatever is happening in the world around us becomes our truth, whatever that is. We make lifetime decisions. And sometimes the people that we... Um, that we interact with have made a lifetime decision. And it's that foundational belief from that decision, whatever it is, that runs the way that we, that we interact with other people. So let's use what's happening in our world right now. Um, there's a lot of, of rioting. There are some people who are very angry and, um, the foundational belief in, in many of those cases, I'm not going to say all because I haven't spoken to all of them, but the foundational belief is that the system isn't fair. Now, if I operate from that foundational belief, then I'm going to be aware of anything that matches that. I'm going to be looking for it. Likewise, if I have a different belief, if I have a belief that the system is fair, I'm going to be looking for something else. Um, so let me tell a silly little story to kind of give you the idea of that. There, there's a story about um, an old man sitting outside of a town, and there, there are two travelers. One traveler is a little ahead of the first, the first one. Uh, of, of the of the second one and uh, the first traveler gets to the edge of town and he sees the old man sitting on the bench and he says hey mister what's that town up there like and the old man says well what was it like where you came from he said oh it was horrible the people were mean they were nasty they'd steal the shirt off your back you couldn't get along with anybody it was just horrible and the man said I bet that's what you're going to find up there. I bet you'll find the same thing. 
And then the second traveler came, same old man, same town, same bench. And the second traveler said, hey, mister, what's that town like up there? And um, the old man said, what was it like where you came from? And this fellow said, said, oh, it was amazing. The people would give you the shirt off their back. They'd help you. Everybody got along. People were kind and respectful. It was wonderful where I came from. And the man said, that's what you're going to find up there, son. So how can that be? How can two different people traveling the same road, going to the same town, have two different experiences? It has to do with what we're aware of. You know, when we're kids um, and we go to school, we're taught our five senses. We're taught seeing and hearing and smelling and, you know, we're taught all that, but we're not taught our spiritual senses. We're not taught things like our, our mind or our will or perception. We're not taught about imagination. And, and this idea of imagination is really powerful when we're working with people who have adverse childhood experiences, or if we're working with any, anybody, if we're, if we're uh, looking for something in our own lives. When, when the children were coming to Jesus and the disciples were like, no, 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 get, get away, go, go, go. Jesus said, let them come for such is the kingdom of, of God, such is the kingdom of heaven. How can the kingdom of God be like a child? If you think about that for just a moment, children have something that, uh, that we've learned to shut off and we've learned to um, put away. And that is this thing called imagination. Imagination is really powerful. And if you think of children that have been in your life or ones that you've interacted, or maybe you can even remember when you were a child, what did you... What did you do when you pretended? Like, who were you? Or if you have a child or a grandchild, or if you interact with a child, when they pretend, are they really pretending? Are they, or are they really that thing? They're really that thing. When I was a child, I loved to play cowboys and Indians, and I was always the Indian, and I could hide behind a tree, and people could walk by and not see me. I could walk through the woods and not break a twig. I could shoot that bow and arrow in a way that I hit my target every single time. And so what about you? Today, when, whenever we're adults, we often use our imagination to torment ourselves more than to help ourselves. And you, you know this, what happens? Um, we have a conflict with someone well, they're just going to say this, and we walk down the worst case scenario, or better yet, someone's late. What do we do? Oh, they're late. And then we start wondering, are they okay? Was there an accident? This happened to me just um, a year and a half ago. We, um, we went to a graduation at Salisbury. Um, my sister, my mother, and I were staying in the hotel together, and my sister decided to go out with some friends and she didn't come. It's two o'clock in the morning and I'm, where is she? I call her cell phone. She's not answering. And uh, I, then I start thinking, well, is everything okay? Where is she? I start calling the, the police departments to see if there's an accident somewhere. You know, we walk down a worst case scenario. And then when we find out it's something else, what do we do? I can't believe you. Do you ever do that? We use our imagination more to torment ourselves. But God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And some versions say above what we imagine. So my question is, what do we want to imagine? When we've had adverse childhood experiences, whatever they are, we may imagine that the world is a dangerous place. We may imagine um, or we've experienced that it really is a dangerous place. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the washing of the water of the word. Um, we work with uh, 
and have worked with people in recovery at the rescue mission at Gail's house, at Gail house at the ranch. Um, I'm the executive director of the Marriage Resource Center of Frederick County, and we have couples come in who um, are preparing for marriage, but many who come in are in a marriage or some kind of a relationship, and they're not getting along. And, and, and what do we do? We do exactly this thing. We work with adverse childhood experiences, first to identify what we have. So I'll just say in my life, I have um, seven or eight adverse childhood experiences out of 10, um, depending on how I answer one of those questions. And um, why is that important? It's important for me to know, first of all, because um, if you have six or more, you have an increased risk of heart disease, liver disease, lung disease, like significantly. Um, if you have six or more, you are 42 times more likely to become an injection drug user. You know, there are a lot of stats that go along with this, but God, but God. Um, I was going somewhere. Where was I going? <laughs> That's one of those moments. <laughs> Um, it's, it's important, it's important to remember that we get to use our imagination in a way that's powerful. And so back to the story that I was telling about the people approaching a town, um, adverse childhood experiences will cause us to be aware of things in a particular way. And so it's important to learn to become aware spiritually, to be aware of the Holy Spirit, because when we have a particular thought, we get to choose what goes along. There's a, an immediate feeling. At that point, we have that feeling we get to choose. I get to choose to stay with a negative feeling, or I get to choose a positive alternative. And depending upon what I choose, the action that follows will accompany. So example, I have an angry thought. I have that feeling in my body. The moment I have that feeling in my body of anger, I get to choose, am I going to lash out at another person or am I going to take a deep breath? Let myself feel the anger. It's okay to feel it. And then choose to have a conversation that's productive and have a productive result. Make sense? So likewise, we get to use our imagination to imagine whatever that future is. Um, wh what do I mean by that? Um, it has to do with our awareness. Are we aware of the Holy Spirit? Are we aware of God's work in our lives? If we believe the word of God, do we really, really believe the word of God? Um, do you ever buy a new car? and you hadn't seen that car on the road anywhere, and then all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. You know, I bought myself a white Avalon, didn't see any of them, and then all of a sudden I, there's a white Avalon, there's a white Avalon, there's a white Avalon, they're everywhere. It's what, bec what we become aware of. And that's, that's exactly how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Whenever we begin to, um, transform our minds and help others to transform through the washing of the water of the word, suddenly we become aware of the spiritual battle that's happening, the things that we've been um, aware of in our lives, the way that we have been uh, making choices. And, and when we do that, tra lives are transformed. I'll tell you sometimes in one conversation, and I'm just going to wrap it up with this. Whenever we're working with people, um, we talk about adverse childhood experiences and whatever you have experienced or your friends have experienced or the people you run into have experienced, everybody is normal for what they've been through. Everybody. Doesn't matter where they are. Doesn't matter if they're strung out on drugs. Doesn't matter if they're fighting everybody doesn't matter. Every single person is absolutely normal for what they've been through. And, and when we say that, there's a, you can sense a sigh of relief in people, no matter who they are, whether they're a homeless person on the street or um, 
someone who's well to do and just not having a good time in their relationships. Every single person is perfectly normal for what they've been through. That's one. So what we do is um, we do some exercises where we do an I want exercise. I want a taco for dinner. I want to buy a new car. I want a happy relationship. And once we get past that exercise, um, in that exercise, sometimes we learn things about a person's heart. And then we, then we practice uh, communication, a listening exercise. I would like more of washing the dishes together after dinner because it would make me feel more connected to you. And the listener's job is to not respond, to shut off the voice in the back of the head and to be able to repeat back exactly what was said. I heard you say you would like more of us washing the dishes together after dinner because it would make you feel more connected. When we, when we learn to have conversations, all of a sudden we get to the heart of the matter. And I will tell you that we've had couples come in who have not been speaking for days. They've driven separately to the office. And in one conversation, when we get this idea of adverse childhood experiences, how it affects us, and we learn to say what we want, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. Doesn't the Lord say that? And when we learn to hear with our ears, with no judgment, all of a sudden relationships are healed, hearts are healed. And, um, and we've had many couples come in, like I just described, come in the door not speaking and walk out the door holding hands and going on a date. So I want to say to you, um, thank you for what you do. I think I've talked way too long. <laughs> I hope I wasn't rambling. Um, adverse childhood experiences, we all have, we all have them, or we've experienced some, or we know someone who has them. The Lord is the healer of, of those experiences. He knows the plans that he has for you, for me, for the entire world, the plans for good and not for, not for harm to prosper us, to give us hope in a future. And when we grab a hold of that through the washing of the water of the word, when we grab a hold of that, we become aware of our, in our lives, everything changes. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be with you. I have rambled a long time and uh, I'll be ready to answer any questions you might have.